get you to turn with your Bibles in uh, Romans 15.4. I'll give you just a second. You can probably leave it there. I'm sure it's going to be our subject this morning. <clears throat> Romans 15.4. It reads, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Well, happy Sabbath. Good, welcome. Good to see everybody again. Uh, week two, going by fast, isn't it? The scripture that was given this morning, by the way, uh, Craig said, "Keep open there." You can keep open there for a moment. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me one more time before we get into that, though, so I can calm down and we'll let God do the speaking. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here this Sabbath. Everyone that's come here today, Lord, we've come here once again to hear from you. And I pray that the message today will speak to our hearts and our families. In Jesus' name, amen. So it says that there's two verses actually in the New Testament that deal with this very thing. And I like to point it out a lot. Um, basically telling us that the things that are written in the Old Testament are written as examples for you and I so we don't make the same mistakes. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's very interesting because a lot of people neglect the Old Testament readings. There's a lot of churches that neglect that. There, you can go to some churches, actually, and all they supply in their pews or whatever for Bibles is New Testaments. Have you ever seen that take place? It drives me crazy because it, there's a whole lot in the Old Testament, and it applies to us. Now, it's kind of tough. Uh, as, as we open them up, we realize that we read these stories, and, and I, I, I really enjoy saying, what's the matter with these people? And then God will speak to us and say, uh, what's the matter with you? You know, um, these stories are written for an example, and you're making the same mistakes oftentimes. So we're going to look at those just for that reason. So the text, Romans 15, 4, said, what, Whatever things are written aforetime or written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So we're learning from the things that are written aforehand. And the other text is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I think it's verse 11, uh, where it simply says, All these things happen to them for examples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. So it goes through a list in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 of all the thing, a lot of the things that happened in the Old Testament and all, a lot of the mistakes that they made. And it says, now these things are written so you don't make the same mistakes. And I read that story and I'm like, it's amazing that we're making the same mistakes. And I don't want to do that. And so with that said, the title of the message today, a new name, we're going to go through some, an Old Testament, a few stories leading up to one main one that uh, we're going to learn from, I think, a lot today, titled The New Name. By the way, does anybody here, by chance, happen to know Gideon's nickname? In the Bible, Gideon had another name that he went by. Does anybody know what that name is? If you do, raise your hand. I want to see if anybody knows it. Anybody know that? What is it? Do you know what it is? Jerubbabel. Very good. So one person, Jerubbabel. Yeah, Jerubbabel, Jerubbabel, how do you say that? I don't know. But uh, he had that nickname. Now, the question is, does anybody know why he got it besides you? Obviously not, since nobody, hardly anybody knew the name. Very good. We're going to learn that today because it's an important lesson for us as well. I want a new name. Isn't it interesting? We learned, we learned a little bit last week that from the Bible that God says, if you overcome, I will give you a new name. Right? And I want the one that, that God actually assigns to us for whatever reason. So let's go into this. Judges chapter 2. Judges the second chapter. <clears throat> Wait until you see how this applies to you and I today. Basically what's happened here, Moses is dead, Joshua and the children of Israel, they were supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the land and to possess the land. They were to make no agreements, no compromises with the worshipers that were in the land. Right? Anybody that may be left, left alive and remain or whatever, the, the ones that had, they, maybe they haven't yet driven out, whatever the case, they were not to make any alignments, any, any um, um, agreements with those people, and they were especially not to be worshiping like them. That was what God had told them to do. Drive them out and, and continue on until all the promised land would then be dwelt uh, upon and, and uh, lived in by his people. And they were to be an example to the rest of the world what it would be like. if it, look, look what happens to these people that actually live for God, do what God would have them to do, and look at the blessings God puts upon them and all the prosperity that they have taking place in their lives, how, how at peace they are. Look at this. Now, if you will live for the same God, you can have the same blessings. That was the, that was the idea there. You know, it's, it's interesting when you read through. Sometimes people uh, will read it and not really grasp the idea of what God's doing. 
He didn't want the children of Israel just to have that land so they could be isolated from the world and, and would not be a sharing of the gospel. They were to be an original uh, church, if you will, that lived and done everything according to the way God would have it done so that the other people would look at them and say, I want what they have. I want to worship their God. And it would spread through the earth, that being the center point, right? They failed miserably. Instead, it's mind-boggling until you look at us today it's mind-boggling that instead of doing what God would have them to do, they began doing what the heathens were doing and the, the false worshipers were doing that God had told them to have nothing to do with. So let's go to um, Judges chapter 2 and look how this plays out. Judges chapter 2, verse 1, it says, An angel of the Lord came up, up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt, and I brought you into the land which I swear to your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You will make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You will throw down their altars, but you have not done, obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? And I can give you lots of reasons why. Actually, you can just apply it to our day. It's so unkind and mean to throw down somebody else's altars and tell them that they're worshiping wrong. Can you imagine the mindset of the people? I mean, I want you to understand that people, believe it or not, you're no different than the people back then. You think basically the same way. You just have more technology. I, I, I've told these people before, it drives me crazy how I hear, oh, this generation, they're like no other generation ever. They're this or that. No, we think the same. Right? We have different technologies. We have different um, um, things that we, that we have here. But our mindset is generally the same. And I can picture the people here from, from one side of the aisle or the other saying, it seems like it's so harsh and unkind to just say flat out these people are wrong or bad. Let, let's, let's see if we can, um, um, well, as we're going to see here, maybe we can learn to get along. And my friends, light can't get along with darkness. Okay? And, and not, that we're not, not in any way that we're to be unkind, but understand, for these people here particularly, God had told them to do this thing. And in this very similar way, God has given us specific, explicit instructions on how we're to live our lives today and how we're to act and react and respond with others. You can read right through the New Testament, and it gives you some really good details. Unfortunately, we're not learning from the past sometimes. So let's go on. Verse 3, Wherefore I, I said also, I will not drive out them from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words, that all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and cried. They wept. They called the name of the place Bochum, which means weeping, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Uh, and I love this. You read down through here, too, and it's, um, they wept because they had been told that they're doing wrong and bad, but it doesn't say they changed anything. True belief, true repentance, Right? That's not what this is. It, didn't, it never mentions them changing anything. They just, they're just sad at the consequences they were going to have to reap. Verse 6, When Joshua let the people go, the children of Israel went every man to his inheritance and possessed the land. And the people served... Now listen to verse 7. Incidentally, if you, if you like marking in your Bible the things you want to remember later, verse 7 is a very powerful one that applies to us, I think. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of of the Lord that he did for Israel, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the, the servant of the Lord, died. 110 years old. So Joshua dies right there. But, but follow this. All the time that, the, that Joshua's alive, all the time that the, that, the, that the leaders of Israel were alive that had seen all the great things that God had done, everybody, in general, everybody, I mean, the, the people kept God's word. They followed God. But this generation died off. <clears throat> This is a very, if you, if you look at the history of God's people from the very first recorded in the Bible all the way to the day we're living in, you find a cycle that takes place. It's a cycle of we're in desperate need, we turn to God, God please help us, God intervenes. I mean, honestly, those, all of us sitting here right now in this country we're sitting in is an intervention of God. You know, I know there's people today that say, oh, that's nonsense, you know. And it, no, it, it was intervention of God to raise up this country and for you to be blessed with the freedoms you've been blessed with, right? 
But we've come to the place even now, I mean, from the, both the church perspective and the political perspective, where we're not appreciating the great gifts that God has given us. And you see the, 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 the road that's taking us on. You see where you're going with that. And this is interesting here because it says as long as these people were alive that had seen the things that God had done, they appreciated those things, they, they while that was happening, were appreciative and doing what was right. But as soon as those people died off, the next generation forgot. All right? Now let's move on. Verse 9, it says, They buried him in, a, in the border of his inheritance. Verse 10. Another highlighted verse. Also, all that generation were gathered to their fathers. There rose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. This, this different generation, the one that this generation is like no other, you could say. And what made them different? This generation did not remember what God had done to give them what they have. Isn't that an interesting parallel? And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. And, the Lord, and they forsook, forsook the Lord, God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, and the gods of the people that were round about them. And they bowed themselves and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal and his wife, the female and the male god, god and goddess. They quit serving God. I mean, a generation later. I just try to picture that, if you will. One generation goes by, and they saw all the miracles that God did, and give them the land, and, and they took over a land of giants and an impossible task, and they, and they move into the land. One generation goes by, and look what's happening. They're serving the devil. Now, I, I credit this, by the way, to a couple of things, and I still apply it to today. A couple of things, let me, let me give it to you this way. Apparently, the previous generation failed, in some sense, in letting them know and reminding them of the great work that God had did to give them the land. And, and perhaps, perhaps the ones that did try to teach and did try to point them that direction, the next generation just wouldn't listen. What do you know, old man? Oh, young people like that, right? A lot of us are. A lot of the younger ones, right? Oh, what do you know? Oh, I hear about your old war stories, right? Your dad jokes, your war stories. I'm so sick of hearing these things. And they, they turn you off, thinking they know better. <laughs> and then they grow up, and they are not serving God, and things are turning bad, and they're like, why is God letting this happen to me? And they turn back to God. Look how this goes. Okay, drop down to verse 17 with me, if you will. I've got to skip through these kind of quick. We're just going to get the highlights. So basically what happens is God sells them into, into bondage. And verse 17 says, Yet they would not listen to the judges that God had raised up, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves to them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers had walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. So their, their fathers have walked obeying God, so God delivered them, gave them the land, and things were going well. But they turn away from God, and God says, okay, I'm not going to force myself upon you. You can have what you want, and you're going to reap the results. So things start turning bad, and they start whining and complaining about why is everything bad happening to me? Does any of this sound somewhat familiar to you today? Honestly, I, I, it cracks me up, especially the younger, some of the younger people I talk to, I'll say some of them, complaining about how this, it's just not fair. We don't have it as good, and, and I wish it was as good as you guys had it, and, and that previous generation had it. And, and maybe the part of the problem is we're not living as God had, as they did. Maybe part of the problem is with our problems is we're not living as they did and serving God as they did. Maybe we got more important things on our minds today that we see is more important. Verse 18 says, But when the Lord raised them up judges, so God would bring them, notice it wasn't a king, it was judges. It was people, people, as you're going to read through here, that would come in and point them back to God. God would say, okay, we'll raise up a judge, we'll bring somebody in that will point the people back to the true God and things will get better for them. It says the Lord would raise up judges. Then the Lord was with the judge and he delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For, and I love, I love the last part of this. Listen, God's still the same God today, too. Yesterday, today, and forever the same God. Listen to the second part of verse 18. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. God was so tired of hearing about their whining about how things aren't any good anymore. He, he's like, a, like some kind of parent here, I guess. He's going to come in and, and make things better so they'll quit crying to him. All right? So it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves even more than their fathers. That's verse 19. 
in following other gods to serve them and bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their own stubborn way. Now, everybody there at the bottom of verse 19, if you have your Bible and you're looking at that, please put an underline on that. They ceased not from their own doings and their own stubborn way. What was the problem with the children of Israel and all their problems? What was the problem with them? They ceased not from their own doings and their own stubborn way. So that would mean that they're not following what God would have them to do and His way. Could it be possible that today that you and I, as an as a individual, as a, then a family, and then you take to the corporate, to the church, and then the church around the world, could it be possible that, we, that God is trying to get us to follow His way and His way of doing things, but we, we insist on having things our own way and our own stubborn way? Could it be possible? Yeah, not only possible that's happening. Now, I've got to hurry up and get through this pretty quickly to get to the message because this is just the intro. Let's go to chapter 3 of Judges, real quick, to verse 6. It says, um, basically, the same cycle keeps going again. Verse 6, it says, They took their daughters to be their wives. They gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. So God's people then were in the land of all these, uh, the people that were not worshiping God, and they intermarried with them and let their sons and daughters intermarry. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God, and they served Balaam and the groves. By the way, the word groves there, if you look it up, it's the word Astarte, which is um, the same as uh, Ashtaroth or the female goddess, the, the female deity. So therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them to the hand, are you ready for this, of Shushan Rishatham, Rish, Shushan, Shushan Rishatham, Shushan Rishatham. Somebody gave me a book one time on how to pronounce these names, and I tried. Anyway, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Shushan, Shushan Rishatham eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, he raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenes, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. And he went out, made war with, and delivered them from Shushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, unto his hand. And they prevailed against Shushan Rishatham. And the land had rest. Look at this. This is a saying again. I skipped over a couple of these earlier. The land had rest 40 years. Now, it's interesting. 40 years is an interesting number there, right? That's basically a generation. So you had a generation that come up. They were sick and tired of things that were going wrong. They turned to God. They surrendered their lives to Him. They started serving Him. God would then bless them, and they, they would receive the blessings. The next generation would come along and say, What do you know, old man? Forty years later, they would go back the, other, the, back the other direction, and they would even be worse than with the previous generation. And it says in verse 12, And again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened the hand of Eglon. And then it goes through, and he's oppressing them, and God raised up Ehud, and, and he delivers them. And then, then if you go on after Ehud delivers them, chapter 4, verse 1, if you're we're, if we're going through here pretty quickly, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and e when Ehud was dead. So God raises up somebody, he delivers them, he dies, and they go right back to their evil ways. Have you noticed a pattern here? Very similar to the pattern that goes on until I think Jesus comes. Right? It keeps happening over and over and I think it's going to, according to the scriptures, there's going to be like a, a falling away that will take place. And you're going to have some people coming in with what you call revival, where they're turning back to God, and Jesus is going to come, right? He's not going to let this cycle go on forever. Now, after he's dead, children of Israel fall, fall back into evil, and then God raises up Deborah, the prophetess, and she delivers, and through her, they're delivered again. Now we're going to take it down to verse 31 of Judges chapter 5, and then we'll get into the message in the next chapter about Gideon. How would you like that for an intro? You guys aren't planning on getting out of here early, right? Since it's potluck here, you don't have far to go and you'll get food, so you'll make it. All right, so Judges chapter 5, verse 31. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goes forth in his might, and the land had rest 40 years. What do you, what do you think you're going to read next? <laughs> Isn't this interesting? The, the, the pattern that you find here, like every beginning of every chapter or the end of the chapter ends with, the land had rest for 40 years. Another generation goes by. Next generation comes up, is raised up, and they say, what do you know, old man? We're going to do things our own way because we're not like any other generation. <laughs> That's happened all the way down to the time I became a Christian. I've heard that people say that about every 10 years. This generation is different than any other generation. 40 years goes by. 
and we're back in apostasy. But God still has his faithful. He will have them till the end. And we're going to read about one of them now. Let's go to chapter 6 and verse 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Imagine that. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of, the Mid of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, and, which are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And so it was that when Israel had sown, that the Midianites would come up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, they came up against them. And I, I just, by the way, I've been reading through my Bible and, and Spirit of Prophecy. I, I do this yearly reading through both together. And, I'm, and I begin, just got through the book of Judges and reading Patriarchs and Prophets. And I, and I love what you read here about these people. They would wait until the children of Israel and they all got planted and everything. And the crops got to the place where you're about ready to start eating them. And they would just invade the country and camp out and eat all the crops. And then they'd move away after that was done. Wait on them to plant the crops next year. How would you like that? You go and you work all spring, making your, putting your garden, you get everything planted, and then it starts growing, you pull the weeds out, and you're sweating and you're working, and it's getting close time for the fruit, and some guy comes in and beats you up and, and takes your food away from you and then leaves. Would you, what would be your incentive of planting next year, huh? But you know you've got to try to plant because you need the food. And this is what's going on. Would you be discouraged? By the way, and then, and then somebody comes along and says, guys, this is what's getting ready to happen. This wouldn't happen to you if you just served God. And in your mind, you have been serving God. But you haven't been, because you haven't been serving God as God had said. Let me ask you, has God changed from this day here that we're reading about till today? No. Oh. So let's go on. They encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth until you come to Gaza. They left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents... If they come to camp out and eat the food. And they came as grasshoppers from multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Now, verse 6 says, And Israel was greatly impoverished because the Midianites. Now, I know the Bible says that. I understand what it's saying there, that because the Midianites, but that's not why they were greatly impoverished. It says they were greatly impoverished because the Midianites, but the Midianites were there because of their... What word would I use? Their infidelity. They're, they're turning from God, right? The Midianites wouldn't even have been there. So when it says, that, um, don't miss this, I guess this is what I want to say. Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. Israel saw the problem as the Midianites. But the Midianites were not the problem. What was the problem? Israel turning from God. Oftentimes today, my friends, and it still, it still applies to us today. It still applies. When we look out and we see this, this is our problem. But the real problem is I wasn't following God. Right? Uh, the, like we, we find it with, uh, with health, and we find, sometimes we find it with, with finances. Uh, like, just, I know that bad health is going to happen because we're living in a world of sin. I know that bad things are going to happen to good people, and finances are going to be bad because of sin. I understand that. But in general, as, as, a, as a kind of a, as a laid out rule, many of the times our health issues, especially as we're younger, I would say, many of our health issues is a result of us not following God. The health problem comes along, we say, God, how can you let this happen to me? Seeing the health problem as the problem. Or sometimes we'll see the, the financial problem as the problem, but then we, we turn around and find out that, have I been giving faithfully to God all along? Right? Oh, God, how can you let this happen to me? Right? 10%, 90% blessed is a lot worth, worth a lot more than 100% cursed. You've heard that before, right? So sometimes when you read these stories and God says, I want you to learn from them, the children of Israel, I have no doubt, believe the Midianites were the problem. But they weren't. It was because they turned their back on God was the problem. Sometimes what we think the problem is is not the problem. The problem is long before then. Most of the time that's the case. But it says in verse 6, the last part, they did the right thing. I highlighted this one. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. At least they knew where to go for help. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, when they're old I'm going I'm to paraphrase it just a little bit, they'll cry unto the Lord for help. They know where to go. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, because of the Midianites, God gave them what they didn't want. <laughs> the next verse is so good. So they cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, wanting deliverance from the Midianites, and it says, so the Lord sent them a prophet. I don't want a prophet. I want delivered. <laughs> right? The children of Israel didn't want to hear a prophet tell them all the things they're doing wrong. 
They wanted God just to come down and supernaturally deliver them, make their life better instantly, and so they could just go about their life living the way they wanted to live, right? That's what they wanted, but it says that God gave them what they really needed, and that was a prophet. It doesn't say whether it's a male or female. It just says a prophet comes along. It doesn't even mention him by name. One of the most more powerful prophets in the Bible. I mean, it's one of the, people, one of the ones that gave Israel a message that turned them back to God. It says, The Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you. I drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why in the world is that inserted into your Bible? I mean... The, mess, the line is, is coming down through as, as all the previous chapters of the book of Judges kind of coming down with the same mindset. The people turned from God. God would raise up a judge. He would deliver them and bring them, and then the people would turn back to God. Th this time in particular is very interesting in what's being worded here because before he's going to get them to turn back to God, he calls them out with this, with this prophet and says, you're not obeying what God would have you to do. That's why you're in this situation. A incidentally, the wording there, I'm the Lord your God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Does that wording sound any what familiar to anybody here? Does anybody know where that comes from in another place in your Bible? Uh, the Ten Commandments, that's how they begin, right? Exactly how the Ten Commandments begin. God has rec knows for why they're in the situation they're in. And in a sense, there are probably faithful people in Israel, I have no doubt, that knew why the church was in the situation it was in, in this day. God had given directions on how he wanted things to operate. And they thought, you know, it just really doesn't fit my lifestyle. It, what God's asking really doesn't fit the way we do things today. Maybe it did 40 years ago, or 80 years ago, or 80, 90, 100, 120 years ago. No, 110, 20 years ago. I'm not very good at math on the spot. My wife's shaking her head at me. It may have been okay for those people back then, but for us, we're different. We just want God to deliver us, and so God sends a prophet that calls them back to obey Him. Isn't that interesting, the message there, by the way? It was a call back to obey God. You know, those are very popular messages today, aren't they? No more popular than they were back in that day. My friends, part of worship, part of saying I love God, is being willing to do what He says. That's worshiping God. That's loving God. How many of you parents or kids tell you, tell you that they love you every day but never do what you say? Would you ever doubt their love? Can you imagine God's dilemma? We tell him we love him every day, but we never do what he says. Does God know whether or not we really love him? Do you think these people here, the children of Israel, and you know, you studied through, and in their mind, they're worshiping God. Remember the story of the golden calf? Tomorrow is going to be a worship service to Jehovah. And they made a golden calf and danced around half naked. But in their mind, who were they worshiping? Jehovah. These people here, the children of Israel. You know what the word Israel means in the name? Overcomer with God. They call themselves the ones who are the name of Israel, the ones that overcome with God, but yet they were not obeying what God said, and so God had turned them loose, and they, they want God to deliver them, so God sends them a prophet, and this prophet is calling them back to obey him. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. It's not a bad message. It, we, today, the message of loving obedience to God is called legalism. I don't mind being called legalist. It's better than being an illegalist. I'm going to start using that on people. When they call me a legalist, I'm going to say, you're an illegalist. And that's not legalism. Loving and obeying God is what he calls from the, from the beginning to the end. It's the, it comes out of the heart of love. And I know that people have misplaced it, and mis, mis, got the carriage before the horse kind of thing, and, or the horse before the No, the, yeah, the carriage before the horse. And, they, and they, they get the idea that maybe because they're being obedient, they, that then they have merit toward God. No, this is the same thing here. You're saying you love God. We're, not, we're talking basic Christianity here, even in the Old Testament. These people were saying they love God, but they were serving the devil. And Jesus says, if you love me, I want you to serve me. So he calls a prophet up. And so the prophet gives him the voice of what God would have them to do. Now verse 11. This is where the good part comes in. There came an angel of the Lord, and it said under the oak, which was, by, which was in Ophrah, which pertained to Joash, the Abiezerite. 
and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. So the grapes weren't in season yet. He had just a little bit of wheat that they'd, he managed to save up somewhere. So he's over here hiding behind in the, where, the, where you would do the grapes when you'd squash to get the uh, grapes and get the juice out. He's hiding in, the, in that place, uh, threshing his wheat. Hot, sweaty, you know, when they thresh the wheat, that little powdery stuff kind of comes off of it too, right? And it gets, all, it gets on you and get dirty. And you can imagine Gideon bemoaning the fact that here he is hiding to thresh wheat because if he, if he doesn't hide, the Midianites are going to come take his food, what little bit he has away from him, and how sad he would be. And it says, it, while this is happening, while he's over here hiding, the angel of the Lord, verse 12, appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. <laughs> I can picture Gideon. He's over here like doing his thing. The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. He's not talking to me. <laughs> right? Mighty man of valor? When's the last time you saw a mighty man of valor hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat? But God looks upon the heart. First Samuel chapter 16 says, God looks upon the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, right? From the outward appearance, do you think any of us here would have saw Gideon as a mighty man of valor? As he's over there in a wine press hiding. Gideon turns and says to him, listen to this wording. If the Lord is with us, why then is all this happening to us? Um, from the King James it says, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this befallen us? Have you ever thought that before? I've heard, being a, I've been a pastor long enough, I've heard that multiple times, right? Where the people say, if God's with me, if God loves me, why is this happening to me? That's what Gideon said. That applies to today. If God loves me, why are all these bad things happening to me? Have you ever said it yourself without a show of hands? And then, and where's all the miracles we heard of and our fathers told us of? Don't you love that line? The, uh, the fathers told us about all these miracles that used to happen, but we don't see them happen anymore. Let me ask you the question. Are the miracles not happening anymore because um, God doesn't perform them anymore? Or is it perhaps that the fathers were walking with God, serving God, obeying God, and God blessed the work of their hands, and it prospered, and we've turned our backs on God, and we're not following Him, so He's not blessing the works of our hand. Therefore, we don't see the miracles that they saw. Is that possible? Don't you read about them even now? I love it. I hear these mission stories and people that are serving God, literally living their lives and serving God. Miraculous things happen overseas. But the question is, why don't they happen here? And then I hear other people tell me that they're like people that are serving God and they're reaching out, trying to reach people, and they're living for God. And these little miracles happen on a regular basis. Could it be that it's not happening because we're not really living and serving God? That's what the problem with Gideon was. He said, I remember a time when our fathers told us about these things that happened. Um, and he says, listen to this and how it goes on. The miracles which our fathers told us of saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. Isn't that a funny line? But now the Lord's left us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. <sighs> the Lord in his patience. The Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might. Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? You know what I love about this line here? This part from here forward? The fact that God hasn't changed. And God can take one individual. He can take one person and change a whole church. A whole nation. Gideon. The one hiding in the wine press. God says, go. If you'll go, what I'm telling you to do, everything will change. Of course, God doesn't do that anymore, right? God can't just use one person to change a whole nation or a whole world like he has in the past, right? Can you imagine Gideon's mindset? What can I do? I'm just one person, one man. Verse 15, and he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, how will I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm one of the least of my father's house. I can't do anything. There's no way I can do anything for you, God. I'm, my family's the poorest in a poor tribe, and I'm the poorest in my family. I don't have money to do what you want me to do, Lord. I can't go forward. 
Does anybody find this miraculous, the story, besides me? I mean, the very fact that the words being used are the words that we've used. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. Highlighted part. Gideon is not about you. We say that in very cliché today. Oh, it's not about me, it's about the Lord. But then we go as if it's about me and not about the Lord. And so the Lord says to Gideon, I will be with you and you will smite the Midianites as one man. Um, just so you all understand what we're talking about here, the Bible said just a few verses back, I think it was in verse 5, that, yeah, verse 5, they were there as grasshoppers for multitude. Don't worry, Gideon, you can do it. <laughs> and if you remember the story of Gideon, we'll get to the, we'll get to the end real quick here. Uh, God get, get in, gets some victories here, and he, and he calls up the armies and gets everybody together, and they come and they, they got like 35,000 people or something like that, and they said, yeah, let's go get them. And God says, no, 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 you have way too many, Gideon. And I, it always comes to my mind, I remember watching that Veggie Tale with the kids when they were little, and the story of Gideon was there, and the, and the cucumber guy goes over and goes, apparently God says there's too many of us. Some of you got to go back. You know, like he's so disappointed thinking about like the fact that we're already outnumbered. Like, like I got the I got the ratio here. We're already outnumbered, um, 135,000 to 32,000, which is four to one. And God says we're too many. <laughs> and he's like so disappointed. And remember, like a bunch of them go back, and now and then they then they had they were down to 10,000, and which made them outnumbered um, 13 to one. In other words, every one of us had to kill 13 of them in order for us to come out ahead. And he's like, apparently there's still too many of us. <laughs> And then he finally gets it down to where there's 300, and you're outnumbered 450 to 1. And God says, okay, that's enough. We can go take them now. 450 to 1. Now, there's probably about 150 people or so in here today, something like that. I want all of you to look around and look at me. Do you think I can take you all out? Can you imagine? I mean, if you put it in perspective, it's not possible. And if you can imagine Gideon at this point, he, he sees the Midianites out there like grasshoppers, and God says, go, you can get rid of all of them. And you're looking at me, I couldn't get rid of all of you. Well, unless I had a really bad message. <laughs> Verse 17. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in your sight, show me a sign that you talk with me. Remember, Gideon's known for this, isn't he, for signs? Now this, by the way, for those that aren't real up on reading and studying the Bible in this, particularly Old Testament, we're not getting ready to see the story of the fleece here. Gideon is over and over again wanting signs before he'll go do anything. Have you ever had that? Lord, you've got to make it abundantly clear. Okay, If the sun doesn't come up tomorrow, I'll go witness for you. Oh, the sun came up, I better stay home. No, this, Gideon's known for these signs, okay? Here, so here he is. <clears throat> he said unto him, show me a sign. Now, Gideon says, don't go away. Verse 18, don't go away, I pray thee, until I come to thee and bring forth my present, and I'll set it before you. And the angel of the Lord here, it says, he said unto him, I will tarry till you come again. Now, I want you to picture this. God has come down. He's getting ready to deliver God's people right? Now, they've been just, like, everybody's in a terrible situation. Everybody's, it's, it's really, really bad. God shows up. This angel shows up here, particularly, it's, it's, it's the, Lord, the Lord Jesus. He shows up, and he says, I'm going to deliver you. And Gideon says, okay, will you stay right here? I'll be right back. <laughs> he says, I'll tarry, and I can picture him. He has to go kill a goat and cook it. Now, how many of y'all here have ever killed and cooked a goat? Oh, good, nobody. All right. How many of y'all here think, with all of your modern technology, it would take you, how long do you think it would take you, now I'm going to just say the women, now I already had a guy answer, uh, <laughs> how long would it take you, can you, do you cook, can I ask you, how long do you think it would take you to cook a goat if he killed it for you, anybody want to take a guess, how long do you think it would take, with modern technology, how long would it take, anybody? Four hours, four or five. I remember when I was a kid growing up, it took my mom longer than that to make a turkey. Like it would cook all night. Remember that? <laughs> so, so this is going to be a fast cook one. What is it? Half hour in the, in the, in the, in the Instapot. Okay. Technology. So at least a half an hour. Gideon didn't have that. But it says, Gideon went in and he made ready a, a kid. That's a goat. And unleavened cakes of ephah flour, he baked bread. The, fre the flesh he put in a basket, and he put, forth, put the broth in a pot, 
and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. Now, that's like a, that's like a six-hour process, right? Five-hour process. The angel of the Lord, like, I'm getting ready. I want to deliver them, but Gideon's got to have his sign. Because I can't move forward unless I'm absolutely 100% sure this is what God would have me to do today. My friends, the Lord had already told him what he wanted him to do that day. So the angel said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them on the rock and pour out the broth. I can picture Gideon. I just cooked this stuff and I got laid out on the rock. So he did. The angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff and it was in his hand and he touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose fire out of the rock, consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that it was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, Lord God, oh, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face, he thought he's going to die. And the Lord says, Peace unto you, fear not, for you're not going to die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord sends peace. Unto this day it's there in Oprah. Now, Gideon now is believing that God's going to deliver him. Deliver the people through him. He's starting to believe that now. But here's the thrust of the message I wanted it for today. There's a problem in Gideon's family. God can't give victory to the church or to to Gideon and his family, to the children of Israel, until something takes place. I want you to see what this is. It came to pass the same night that the Lord spoke unto him and said, Take your father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father has, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God on top of this rock in the ordered place. There's a problem, Gideon. The reason you're in a situation you're in, and the church is, but I think this is very powerful and very um, uh, encouraging to us. You have an altar to the devil in your house. And we can't do anything to, to, to deliver you until you get rid of this altar. Now, there's a huge problem because apparently everybody in, from the area comes to worship at this altar that his own family has to the devil. Bell worship and says, get in before I can deliver, use you to deliver, you have to tear down this altar. But Gideon knows that the people in the church would not agree with tearing down the altar that they have to the devil. So he has to go and do it at night. This is, this is so, such a great message. It does not change. Look, in your home, you're worshiping the devil and I cannot deliver you, your family or the church until you get rid of that. Not only get rid of that, and which I really love about this, we're very good sometimes about getting rid of all the stuff I shouldn't have, but God never just takes away without replacing it with something better. I, learned, I had to learn that the hard way. When I first became an Adventist, you know, you all are wonderful people. I loved you very much. I still do. You took everything I was eating away from me and either replaced it with nothing or stuff that tasted bad. I remember I was coming to the place where they had me eating. I would go to Taco Bell. And I would order a, a burrito in a hard shell because something was wrong with the floured shell, apparently. And, and I would get it with um, uh, beans, lettuce, and tomato, no cheese, no sour cream, no anything. And, you know, and it's like everything I was eating, everything I was eating was bad. And so I was taking away, taking away, and I wasn't adding to. I come to the place, I started getting sick. And what I really, something I learned about God that I really love and appreciate is God says, tear down, take away the things that don't belong to me, that belong to Bell, but replace it with something I have for you. Don't miss that, my friends. When you, when you meet somebody and you're bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to witness to them, don't tell them about all the bad things they're doing to get rid of without giving them the things that God wants them to have. We are very good at saying don't have that, but... And, and some of the things that are even good, I've had people say, well, you know, you should even the good things in moderation. Okay, I get that. Almost as if you're guilty if you have too much of a good thing. I get that in some ways. Struggle with it a little bit here. The God here says, get rid of the altar to Baal, but build one to God. Before you can go forward, replace it with things of God. Let me, let me give you something here. Story, like, like stories, it's a true story. I've been pastoring for not very long at all. By the way, I never went to seminary. I hope that doesn't disappoint any of you. <clears throat> but I had just started in my, in my first district, and it was a pretty good-sized church. It, it, it had an, a role on the roll of about 290 with about like 80 in attendance when we first got there. And it, was, it was in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, anyway, about my sixth, seventh week there, it was early on, I was preaching a message, and... Uh, 
there was a there was a gal that come in. I, I got to the place, long, been there long enough, I'd recognize everybody that come in. But I saw this gal come in I'd never seen before, and she had a little daughter about like 10 years old. And um, they sat down on the over on this side. At the end of my message, I, I made a little appeal about baptism or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. And, and the daughter come to me afterward and said she wanted to be baptized. And I said, great, I'll start having Bible studies with you. So the next week, I went to the house and, and began to have Bible studies with, with the mom and the daughter. And, and by the way, the mom had been a, a, a raised in the church, but she married this guy and left the church and been out for quite a while and just start, had just started coming back because they want to come and see the new pastor. If that if that's, gets you to church, I'm fine with that. So anyway, so they came back, and the daughter wants to be baptized. I'm starting having Bible studies, and I'm studying with the mom as well. And we're moving through the Bible studies week after week, and we get about to the fourth week or so. Now, they also had a little daughter that I hope... By now, she's grown up and got things straightened out. But she was about two years old, and she was terror. It was tough to get through a Bible study with her. I mean, that's just the way it was, right? But the 10-year-old was really enjoying the Bible studies and learning, and so was the mom. I went and had a study one evening with them. And I noticed during the study, it was like nobody's paying attention. And it was kind of an agitated state a little bit, you know? And at the end of the Bible study, the mom says to me, Pastor... Um, can, I want you, you go, we need some help. We need you to help us. And I was like, well, what is it? She goes, well, can you like cast out demons and stuff like that? And I remember thinking, God, why do I have to have this hard thing? I just started pastoring. Can it be something easy? You know, like, <laughs> why does it got to be casting out demons? First time I have a problem, right? And I was like, but you know, I, I sent up a quick prayer and I was like, Lord, you know, help me here. And so I said, well, what's the problem? What do you have going on? And at this time, the 10-year-old starts getting, like, kind of red in the face, teary-eyed, and kind of agitated looking. She's sitting here. The mom's sitting over here. And she, the mom starts telling me how the 10-year-old is having, like, she has these fantasies and dreams and stuff about taking a butcher knife and killing the family. And she, see, and she was seeing shadows and stuff moving the house. And the mom and the dad both thinks that she's gone, lost her mind, was going crazy, and they were getting ready, like they were going to try to have some help for her until they started seeing things moving in their house, shadows moving, things like that, you know. And she goes, I thought she was going crazy, but she says, I'm seeing these things too. And, and, and this time, the 10 year old's just now crying. And uh, the mom says, you know, she, but she says she keeps having these like dreams and fantasies and stuff about killing us all and stuff like that. And she goes, I don't know what to do. <laughs> in my mind, I was like, I don't know what to do either. And it's like, Honestly, there's been a few times in my life that I really feel like God has spoken to me, to I really understood, you know. And I said to her, well, I don't know that I can do anything to help you or not. Let me ask you, do you have anything in your house that gives the devil access to you? Like a Ouija board or anything like that? Do you have that in your house? And now, we've just been through a few studies, hadn't got into any of the real stuff yet, right? She goes, I know what it is. Now, come back next week and I'll tell you. No, 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 no. I stay with it. All right. So she says, I know what it is. And I, and I was like, okay. So the mom gets up off the couch, and she goes in the kitchen, gets one of those great, big, heavy-duty black garbage bags. She comes back down, and in front of the television, the television's about this tall right here. Underneath it has, the, has a, a thing with uh, doors on it. She opens it up, and it's full of CDs and DVDs. I mean, just like row after row, over like a hundred and some of them in there, right? And it was a bunch of, uh, like, heavy metal songs, music and stuff, and a bunch of bad movies and things. I hadn't said anything. This woman cleans that thing out, takes every one of them out, throws them in that bag. It's a big bag and full of these DVDs and CDs and stuff. She ties it up. She hands it to me. And she goes, I think that's what it is. And I was like, maybe so. And so I prayed with them earnestly. It wasn't just one of those small prayers. I prayed that God would deliver these people. Like, I mean, this is serious. When you've when you got a 10-year-old thinking about killing the family and seeing shadows, that's not a good thing. You know, I think oftentimes today... Um, you ever notice in Jesus' day, he diagnosed a lot of people with demon possession, but today no one ever gets diagnosed with demon possession? We have other things we diagnose it to. I think it still happens today, my friends. We treat it differently, but the same thing's happening. This girl, was, was in, it, was, it was a demon that was giving her a fit, right? I know it sounds crazy in a lot of people's ears, maybe, but it's what was happening. Let me tell you the rest of the story. I grabbed that garbage sack. Incidentally, her husband was a garbage man. It's very interesting here. And, and she tells me, as I'm leaving, be careful. <laughs> it's like she's believing this, right? So um, I took the garbage sack, I put it in my car, and I drove it and found this dumpster, and I just threw it in the dumpster, got rid of it. And um, after we prayed with him, got rid of that thing. The next week, when they show up at church, she comes running to me, she says, Pastor, it's been so strange. 
She says, since we've been married, my husband and I have fought almost every day for something one day or the other. Since I've gotten rid of those things, we haven't had one fight this week. It's been like our honeymoon. And she said, instantly, the daughter is no longer having these fantasies and stuff. And it's like, it's all gone. She goes, it's just, it's, it's not happening anymore. And then the mom and the daughter both end up being baptized. I don't know where they're at to this day. It's been a long time ago since that happened. But for, for the whole time I was there, their lives were different. It's very interesting to me, like sometimes we say, oh, that's this. Even people here sitting here probably right now may be thinking, oh, that's just craziness. That is no way. It happened. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. And many people sitting here perhaps have things in their home, in their lives, that belongs to the devil giving him access to them and think, oh, that's just nonsense. But yeah, they can't figure out why, it's so, why, their, why their mind is so messed up and why their life is so messed up. Maybe it's time that we go home and get rid of a few things. By the way, I had this message, <laughs> this one similar to this. And because uh, if you read in the book of Acts, I got to get you there Let, real quickly. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Let's go keep your place marked there. Acts 19, I want to show you something here. Um, is this going too long? Okay. I only got a few that said that. That's enough for me. <laughs> in Acts chapter 13, uh, the gospel is going like gangbusters, and these guys try to come in Acts chapter 19, and, and, and uh, this, uh, these vagabond Jews, rather, it says in verse 13. And they tried to cast out, G, cast out demons in the name of Jesus who Paul preached. Remember the demon beat him up? The guy beat him up and sent him out naked? Now look at right under that, though, in verse um, 17. This thing was known unto all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them. All that were the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many of that believed and came, listen, they confessed and showed their deeds, and many of them also which uh, used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all them. And they counted the price of them that were found at 50,000 pieces of silver worth of, of books. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. He doesn't say anything about them going and telling them to get rid of this stuff. They knew it was wrong. When they turned to Jesus, they knew that what they had before was wrong. They burnt the stuff, and then God's word mightily grew and prevailed. Could one of the things be the reason God's word maybe not mightily prevailing and, and being victorious in our lives today is because so many of us have so many of the devil's things in our home. It might be a good time to go burn some things. Now, don't be mean. Don't take your... Go, it, uh, oftentimes, here's what I think is funny. The parents will go home and take the kids' stuff and burn it. <laughs> Especially when they're older, my friends. They've got to be their decision. And it can't be with you harping on them because it's bitter. It has to be a touch of the heart. If God touches your heart to get rid of something you have, it might be a good thing to do. I preached this at my church, invited everybody over to my house to get rid of anything they want to get rid of. We're going to have a bonfire. That fire burned so hot. I'm telling you, we had people bringing sacks of stuff and throwing on this bonfire. We were out in the country, and there's plastic and CDs and DVDs. I hope there's no environmentalist people here to get upset with me. This was great for the environment, though, because the environment changed. After they got rid of this stuff, right? And so we threw it all in, and it burned, and black smoke, we was doing it at nighttime out in the country in the evening, it's the Vespers thing, smoke just rolled up. We did, we had a lot of people bring a lot of stuff, and uh, in two years' time, we had 50 souls baptized. It just happened. I credit some of that to the fact that, that God's people, some of them were willing to give up things they knew they shouldn't have. And maybe some of you may need to do that today. Yeah, I remember the story about the guy said, well, I got some good liquor in here. What do you want to do with that? There's no such thing as good liquor. Pour it. <laughs> so Gideon, before you can do a great thing for God, what did God tell him to do? Get rid of the altar you have. The, the things you have in your home that belong to the devil, get rid of those. And replace it with things that belong to God. <laughs> so let's go back to the storyline here in verse 27. Gideon took ten men of his servants... And did, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household, the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, so he did it by night. Listen, he wanted to get rid of the things in the house that God told him to get rid of that belonged to the devil, and he realized he couldn't do it during the day because the church folk would get mad at him and beat him up. So he snuck and did it at night. And when the men of the city, that would be God's people, arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cast down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. Must be something pretty distinctive between an altar to Baal and an altar to God, because they realized the second altar that was built wasn't one to Baal. 
There was another altar there. It's not like he just went in and ripped the place up and tore it down. He built a brand new one. But only the new one was for God. And they were mad. They wanted to kill him for tearing down their altar to the devil and building one to God. And these are the people of Israel. Could it happen anything like that today? Could you go in and say, guys, what we're doing isn't right. This is not what God told us to do. And by saying that, they're going to hate you for doing so, tearing down an altar to Baal that we have built. Gideon did it. Faithfully to God. Began in his house. And when the men of the city arose, they saw it was like that. Verse 29. And they, they would be who? The church folk. Said one to another, who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. And the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die, because he's cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the grove that was by it. There was no mention of the altar of God that had been built, though. These people, God's people, have been worshiping wrong for so long that when they were called back to do things right and worship God, they saw it as a threat to them and wanted to kill the one that was calling them back. Aren't you thankful it's not like that today? It is the same way today. You can go into a lot of Seventh-day Adventist churches today and call them back to worship God and it won't be appreciated. It's, and I'm not saying that to be derogatory to the church at all. I think most of God's church is faithful everywhere. I believe even in churches that aren't following what God would have them do, God has his faithful people there. I have no doubt about that. In this world, God's people, there are those faithful people. But the call, my friends, this hasn't changed. There are multitudes worshiping what they think is God all along. They're not. God doesn't want you to be those people. Took a lot of nerve for Gideon to do what he did, didn't it? Takes a lot of boldness today, my friends, for all of us to be faithful to God because you're in a world that's not. It's tough. But God has promised help. He promised Gideon help. And I love how this ends here because Joash, Joash the faithful, even though he's the one that had the altar to Bel there, he comes out and he says, verse 31, Joash said to all the people that stood against him, Are you going to plead for Bel? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it's yet mourning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one has cast down his altar. In other words, what, a, what an affront to the people there. He says, look, if you're serving a god, if you believe a bell so powerful and so good, let him kill him. Let him kill Gideon. Let him take care of it. If he's such a powerful god, apparently he's not a, a god that you have to go protect. Therefore, on that day, they called him Jerubbabel. Very good. Saying, let Baal plead against him because he's thrown down his altar. And that's what they began to call Gideon there as a nickname was Jerubbabel. I love the idea of having that uh, nickname, don't you? Now, I had one when I was a little kid. I told you that one last week. Does anybody remember that one? Pigpen. I didn't like that one. And when I got older, somebody gave me another one. I'm never going to tell you what that is, and I hope you never figure it out. And, and that one, when I go home today to Kentucky, I still got that nickname. When I go home, my, my teachers call me by that name. It was just my life, right? But to have this nickname, because you're a servant of God, because you served and lived for God, you've done something for him, everybody looks at everybody that would see Gideon from then on and says, oh, yeah, that's the one that tore down Baal's altar, Jerubbabel. He's the one that made a stand for God. In the face of the rest of the church going one direction, he went the other. He's a faithful man of God, Jerubbabel. Wouldn't you love to have something like that for your nickname? When people see you, they say, oh yeah, he's the one that stands for God. What a life to live. Now let me finish the storyline and I'll let you all go eat. Verse 33 says, All the Midianites and the Malachites and the children of the east gathered together and went over it and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 36, down down, it says, Gideon said to God, If you are if going to save Israel by my hand, have you said, Behold, I'll put a fleece of wool on the floor. <laughs> so here it is. He said, I'm going to put a piece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only and the ground around it dry, uh, then I'll know that you have certainly sent me to save Israel by your hand. And so the next morning he got up and the fleece was wet and the ground was dry and Gideon thought, now wait a minute, fleeces, they kind of absorb water. Okay, Lord, if you really want me to go, please don't be upset, but make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And so the next day the ground was wet and the fleece was dry and Gideon's like, 
Okay, I'll go. I still say that says something about God to us today, too. Do you know God's patient with you in the same way? I'm thankful because uh, I think most of us, me included, would have been zapped with lightning by now if he wasn't. And so then, uh, Jerubbabel, verse seven, chapter 7, verse 1, Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people that are with you are too many. <laughs> because if I give you the victory the, 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 against the, the Midianites, Israel will vaunt themselves up against me and said they've done it with their own hand. So then God got him down to uh, 10, 000, from, um, from 32,000 down to 10,000. And then finally God got him down to 300. He says, okay, now go. And you know the rest of the story. God, through the hand of, Midian, or the, the hand of Gideon, Jerubel, delivered his people with 300 people against 135,000 Midianites. Impossible odds, impossible situation. But listen... God would never have done it and could never have done it had Gideon not first surrendered his will to God's. And God hasn't changed. You want things maybe a little different in your life today? Maybe we have to destroy the altars we have in our homes to Baal, build altars to God, and be serving Him. I think God's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And again, I want to encourage you, if, as you go and you think about the things that perhaps maybe I need to have taken care of and fixed, don't be thinking about your teenage son or daughter, or your adult son or daughter, even sometimes your younger ones. Start with you, in your own heart, in your own homes. And I think, I believe, from what we read in the story, and God, the Bible says he hasn't changed, that God will do the same today as he did for them. You want to see God do great work in his church and around the world? It starts with you. It starts with me. So I want to encourage you, my friends. It might be hard to get rid of some things. It may, may have been something we've been clinging to from, from the devil our whole lives. But it may be time to let go of it. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today we are thankful for your word. Thankful for these stories that we find in your word that teach us about ourselves. And Lord, I pray for every, every soul here, for every one of us, that we'd be willing to give up the things that you would not have us to have in our lives and our homes. Lord, that we will be able to replace them with things that are good and right. Lord, I pray you'll forgive us for we have sought the things of this world and sought friendship with the world. And I pray, O oh Lord, that we too, each one, can have a new name one day. But even now, be recognized as those people that serve you. Lord, I pray that as we go about another week very soon, that it, won't just not, it will not just be another time where we just go away and spend our week and come back to worship you again. But may you be on our thoughts and our minds, Lord, for this will be eternity. And um, I just pray your sweet blessings on each one of our families here. In Jesus' name, amen.